Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, world-class tracking, mixing, and mastering engineers, Peter Coleman and Richard Dodd. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Rich Redman here. This is another episode of The Rich Redman Show coming to you live from Crash live. Studio, beautiful Brentwood, Tennessee. And I'm so excited about our guests this week because they are both award-winning recording, mixing, and mastering engineers, longtime friends. Guys, please help me welcome Mr. Peter Coleman. Yeah. And Mr. Mr. Rich. Richard Dodd. Yeah, How are buddy. you guys? Thanks for coming. I'm going to do the... Uh... So many years of working together. And you guys have never been over to Crash Studio. Never. Everything we do is at Treasure Isle Studios in Berry Hill. Yep. They call it Music Hill now, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Nice little niche it suburb. Is, it is. Right? There's like 30 or 40 studios there in little houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of like the new Music Row because Music Row now in Nashville is we have historic studios being leveled yep. or turned row. into condos, yeah. which is, you know, I had, you know, uh, Eddie Bear is an award winning drummer. I'm sure you guys have worked with a million times. Yep. And he's like, this, it's not a bad thing. It's progress. You know, yeah. it's just we need this. Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. My trusty co-host and co-producer. How are you doing, man? Doing well, man. This is a beautiful I day. wonder what the Jim McCarthy embarrassing moment of the show will be this time. Oh, we will see it. We're we will witness it. It'll happen. And it happens inevitably every single show. So weren't you telling me some interesting story yeah. before we get into a conversation with these, you know, gentlemen. Everybody has funny stories about their moms, right? Oh, yeah. So my mom, a couple of weeks ago, she tells me uh, she's going out to see. She says, I'm going to see uh, that Jason Aldean. He's, he, he's coming to Florida. And I said, okay, uh, that's good. You know, that's a, it's a good show. You're going to enjoy it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, great. You know, she, so she tells me, she, she calls me on Friday night and she says, so I'm going to see the show tomorrow night. Anything I should be knowing about? I'm going to just go see the show. <laughs> Say hi to my buddy Rich. So, yeah. You know, wave, wave to him. Yeah. And uh, she comes back. Uh, I call her on Monday and she tells me, uh, so I said, hey, so how was the show? You know? She's from the Bronx. <laughs> really? Not very good. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Oh, okay. D -d Tell me how you really feel. She goes, it was, uh, you know, all this music started sounding the same after about an hour. <laughs> and uh, we left. And uh, that was it. It, it was really loud. It wasn't very many people there. It was very confusing. And I said, what? Not very many uh, people. Not very many people. What are you talking about? And then I remember talking to you and you said that you guys were in Philadelphia. So I'm like, well, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago she saw it. Maybe I misunderstood what she was saying. And, and I go, well, tell me more about it. You know what? what, what the, she says, well, I didn't expect them to play canned music. I'm like, canned music? What? So I don't like, remember him playing. This is, play, this is play not tracks. adding up, Jim. Right. And I'm, I, know, I know they play the click tracks and yeah. everything for the lights and you know the, the, the sequences. But I'm going... Uh, something doesn't add up here. Yeah. Okay. And she goes, you know, for something that's the ultimate Aldine, I go, okay, uh, mom, I, I think you saw a tribute band. She saw the impersonator <laughs> tribute guy. And it really isn't even a tribute. I mean, these, this guy is walking around pretending to be Jason. Dude, the best thing is he's yet to come. I said, where did you see this? Yeah. I said, was it like, you know, the Hartford Civic Center where we used to go to see hockey games and stuff? She goes, oh, no, no. It's an auditorium. We go to see shows down here. I said, Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. in Ormond Beach, not even Daytona. And yeah. I'm going, that was the first flag. I'm like, Ormond Beach? He's going to Ormond? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, then she, and I said, what kind of auditorium was it? She goes, it was an auditorium. I said, well, like a high school auditorium? She goes, yeah, like oh, Danbury boy. High School where I went to high school. Yeah, yeah like that. I said, mom, yeah. if Jason Aldean is playing a place like that, you're going to have a line wrapped around the friggin' city yeah. to, for people to get in. And she goes, no, it was him. I said, she was, she's just stubborn. She was convinced. Yeah, well, it wasn't. So, yeah. <laughs> Mama McCarthy, you did not see us. You saw the impersonator. She got really embarrassed, and I, and I, I laughed at her, and I said, Ma, you got to laugh at yourself. I got I to meet her, because Jim and I are both Canadians. We're both from Connecticut, and both our, all of our parents moved to Florida, because I guess that's what you do, right? If you're not in the music business and you're over 60, you move to Florida. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Learn by doing, I definitely think, resonates with what we're about here at the School of Rock. I'm Angie McCright, and I'm the owner of the School of Rock in Franklin and Nashville. 
I would say that the majority of kids that come in have either been sitting in their bedrooms watching YouTube, learning how to play, or they've taken music lessons at some point in their life. We do have a lot of beginners. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can participate in our programs, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced. We don't teach music to put on shows. We put on shows to teach music. Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Do you have funny stories about that like with your mom? I've got a ton of them. My mom is super high energy. I mean, I usually bring up the uh, the fact that she outworks me. I mean, she's 72 years old and she works out three hours a day, four days a week. She does a spin class, a Pilates class, and a body pump class. And I'll go to like do body pump with her. It's like where you work out to music and you do like bicep curls for like three and a half minutes, the length of a song. And you know, you're a guy and so you're looking to the girl next to you and you're like, oh, she's got 20s. I'll, oh, I'm going to do like 35s. And then 30 for seconds in, you're like, oh my God, I got another three <laughs> minutes to go. <laughs> well, how many reps is that? I like mean, 100? That's a lot. Oh my gosh. Yeah, body yeah. pump. It's Setting fun. your arms on fire. So, let's not waste any more time because no. we have got, you know, music royalty here. That's right. Pete. Rich. We have been working together a long time. Matter of fact. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and you are. <laughs> yeah. So, so for our viewers out there, our listeners, if you're not familiar with these gentlemen, um, they're both, uh, they've ex they have experienced every facet of the music business being recording engineers, mixing engineers, they've produced records and Maybe 20 years ago, you you said, I'm going to do the mastering thing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and you guys are all fantastic what you do. We've done every Jason Aldean record together. You've recorded every record together, every hit, every number one, and you've mastered every record. That's right. That's incredible. So for our non-musicians out there, tell us what a recording engineer does and what a mastering engineer does. In, in a nutshell. Yeah. As well, we show also, up. Right. Set the mics up. And we check all the mics. <laughs> Pound coffee. And we say, Rich, go hit them. Mm -hmm. And then we just basically go through the whole band and make sure everything works. Right. And then we don't, honestly, even until everybody starts playing down a specific song, mm -hmm. because everything's different, you know, you really don't do that much, even until you start playing down a song. Right. And then you kind of dial it in for that even specific song. Mm-hmm. And then we mix it, and then he screws it up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we do Just every kidding. good bit on the record that doesn't get credit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so world. mastering, from my, from my recollection, when I was in a band, and we cut demos when I was in Connecticut and stupid bands that I was Jim in. Jim used to play drums, or still does. Okay. I still play drums. Yeah. And Do you? Oh, yeah. Are you a drummer? <laughs> Who are you again? Come on. Um, Who are you again? So yeah. you basically have... The ability it's like a, it's like getting a second set of ears correct right is that what mastering is you think or is how is it's that how you describe it another opinion right yeah, yeah. i mean uh, has anyone missed a mark or an opportunity sonically and then you've got a chance to globally right change it you know but um you can't do anything about the drums in mastering unfortunately yeah, yeah. You get what you get. You, you get can't adjust, like tweak the EQ or anything or the compression on a well, kick drum. It's, it's global. Yeah. Right. So in the mixing stage, you can make changes. Right. Okay. But in mastering at the moment, yeah, because things are changing rapidly. Yeah. Because you're speaking my language. I do a lot of this kind of stuff with radio stuff and voiceover and things of that nature. I mean, not to the complexities yeah. you guys know them, but I mean, it's, a, it's pretty amazing to, when we used to think of mastering back in the day, it was... It was like sugarcoating. It was making it sound brighter and bigger. Yeah, and, it's, you know. it's with the, the advent of digital yeah. and yeah. all the stuff we can do. And the thing I, I can enjoy about mastering is not approaching it in the way that it used to be considered. Like you said, you what you could do, you could pretty it up a little. But to just the other day, I added a harmony mm -hmm. to the to the to the track because it could. Yeah, and. Uh, Send it to the client as an option. He preferred it. Yeah. So wow. That's the one. Yeah. And like anything else, it takes us. You got to have a trained ear to do it. Well, you just got to. Th yeah. And you guys trained. Not to date you guys, but you, you know, you learn. Yeah, I don't want to. I'm, you, I'm married. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I got a girlfriend. I don't want yeah, to date right. you. Right. You're a newly single, Peter. You, I heard all the adventures. I love it. Uh, you guys learned the craft back in the, the days of, you know, analog tape. Yeah. yeah well, when we mm. came through the ranks, it was simpler. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I started, I mean, there were only three tracks. Yeah. 
And was the was your education on the job training? It wasn't like Blackbird University where no, two no. years you we, had to you be know. surrounded by it. Yeah, yeah well, know. there was no way you could go to learn your trade yeah. other than you know apply to every recording studio. Mm -hmm. Well, boy, you mean in our case in London? Yes, yeah, and get lucky. Yeah. You, you know, and get an opportunity. Yeah, because someone, Jim, something tells me with these guys, gentlemen's accents, they're not from Smyrna. Let me tell you something. The, the accents just make them describe what they do sound so much cooler. I think this is a panty-dropping accent for I know. sure, guys. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he, he could be talking about wallpaper drying and yeah. it would sound completely epic. Oh, you've heard him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, usually in my normal accent, even I sound just like Forrest Gump. <laughs> You know, this is just for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and when we were chatting before the camera started rolling, we were talking about how you guys met when you were 11 years old. What's that all about? Tell us, tell us your, a little bit about your childhood and, you know, what was your first musical? How did you catch the music bug and decide to do this? What brought you to the States? Well, we met when we were 11. Yeah. Oh my no gosh. It's in the same school. Yeah, right. same school. You mean same yeah. little town, Stopsley. Mm -hmm. Special needs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we promised we weren't going to bring that up, remember? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's and that's good. how we met. You know, we had a little, you know, band in high school. You know, I guess when we were, I don't know, 13 what or What was 14. your act? Yeah, what did you he, play? He was the musician. Right. Not much. Yeah. It was just a little guitar, maybe? Yeah, a little guitar, Keyboard. a little bit of keyboards. He nice. was He was actually a really good I singer. I tried everything, and then it got relegated right down to the bottom, mm -hmm. you know, right. singer. Sing. <laughs> <laughs> so. He had a good voice, though, he did. That's great. He yeah. Did, he had a good voice. And then, so you guys got just, you got interested in, in this craft, and what brought you to, because I know you were working a lot um, in sunny Los Angeles. Did you guys both go to Los Angeles at the same time? Well, I moved there, I think. God, I think it was 81, but mm. God, I can't remember. Um, I mean, I went there because, I mean, the production company that I worked for right. had an office in London and an office in LA. And, you know, it used to be that we would do a lot of recording in London. And then we started to do a lot of recording in other European countries. Mm. Uh, and then one of the partners moved to L.A. Yeah. And I was going back and forth from London to L.A. all the time. And I got sick of it. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a 12-hour flight. Yeah. Yeah. Each way. Mm -hmm. So I just decided, you know what? Yeah, I mean, if we're going to be doing pretty much everything in L.A., then I'm just going to move there. Yeah. And that's what I did. Where did you live? What uh, little borough did you live in over there? Uh, Granada Hills. Oh, nice. Yeah, I really liked it there. Yeah, the valley. The valley. Yeah. And traffic wasn't quite as bad as it is now. Uh, I assume. That was what, yeah. 70s, 80s? I mean... It was 70s. Yeah. 80s, 80s. Oh, so, 80s. I mean, a lot of the Northeast was moving out there. Yeah, but we, it was still, you know, horrific. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I moved here at the end of 1989. Mm. Oh, really? Oh, Nashville? Yeah, Nashville. So, that was the pre... Everyone's gone country, Alan Jackson, boom. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I can remember you I mean, having conversations with people here about, God, the traffic. And I go, what? Here? Yeah. Here. Oh, oh my, my gosh. God. In, in like 1989? Yeah. And know, we, and, and, and the go, traffic uh, consists no, no, of no. horses and hay bales. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is no traffic. <clears throat> right. You know, compared to what I was it, used even to. Even now, I mean, it's a it's kind of a piece of cake. Once you've navigated Los Angeles traffic, you can yeah. handle anything. Once you've navigated New York traffic, you can yeah. handle anything. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's what I did. No, I don't think the traffic's that bad here. Now, now is it worse than it was? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, Richard, when did what was the first city you lived in when you came to the States? Uh, this one. Oh, so you came right to Nashville? No. Oh. <laughs> no, no, he was on Mars for about a year. <laughs> No, my first trip to America was to come see him and his family. Oh, nice. And uh, just for a vacation. Yeah. So my first sight of the US was the movies. It was everything that the movies was. It yeah. was Los Angeles, you know, and it was sunny. So and the Hollywood uh, sign and everything. It's and everything, yeah. And the traffic wasn't as bad because you couldn't see as much of it. Right. <laughs> uh, the see. air was so poor. That's and since been corrected, I think, right? Is yeah. it still smoggy out yeah, there? Yeah, it's much better. No, you can, see, you can see the mountains. And yeah. Across it's been a while for me. They really, I don't, I don't I think go it's, back. It's the car technology that's improved that, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. It is. Vastly, because everyone's driving a Prius, so. Well. We're electric vehicles. <laughs> or an electric car. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. when I was out in Vegas, the smog was getting bad. Yeah. You know, when it started building up. Yep. So, you could see a little haze over the city mm -hmm. from where we were. 
Yeah, they would tell you, LA do East. not run today. Yeah. yeah. You know, smog alert. Yeah. Definitely. We had the Santa Ana wind fires. We would we'd actually smell the fires in Vegas. Yeah, they actually have a fire season. It's crazy. Yep. Um, so, so moving into that aspect of things, getting into what you guys did, it sounds like you guys did a lot of what I did when I got in the radio. I mean, I went to a broadcasting school. Uh, I paid like $9,000 to learn how to cut and splice tape. Wow. Which enabled me to get my foot in the door at a radio station. Yeah. But you guys, sounds like you, you just hung out enough, got your foot in the door at a studio and just absorbed. Yeah. Is I mean, correct? basically the training was, this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, your next thing is an opportunity to do it. And if you don't do it right, you're, you're gone. You're yeah. gone. Wow. So I can imagine the razor in your hand when you're when you're cutting an edit on tape. I mean, sh I mean that would freak me Have out because there no there is no undo or redo. Yeah, no. yeah but you didn't know any different. No, plus. that was the option. Right. Yeah. You know, so you just kind of dived in and did it. I love yeah. it. It's like we'd already recorded an album in his bedroom in his house. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, on a quarter inch, seven and a half Simon tape machine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sound on sound. Do you know what that is? No. Well, that's um, because there's no overdub facility, but uh, the machines have a, an option to turn off the arrays bias. On a tape machine, you need a, a, a high frequency there to excite the arrays head so mm -hmm. that it will actually erase something. So if you turn that off, you can actually record without erasing mm. so you're adding to the sound yes oh, plus wow. there was two tracks so you could record on one track and bounce it to the next one and stuff like that so we already knew everything there was to know that's <laughs> when all the innovations were really cool because you had to do it like that that was that was like like muscle building type of recording yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know to fast forward to today that's oh, the only gosh. way i like uh, digital is yeah. if if you go looking for what you can do rather yeah. than what you're told, you know, like a plugin, this plugin is for this function. Usually, especially if it's a emulation of a real thing, mm -hmm. it's crap. Yeah. You know, but just like everything in the old days, there's usually there's something that's good about it. Crap it's, in, crap out. Yeah. Crap but, uh, <laughs> you know, you can find, <clears throat> you know, this is for a drum. Well, try it on a vocal. Yeah. And you can discover something mm -hmm. and it's going to be, not to do that. Let's or, put this mic on the other side of a toilet bowl, laying yeah, on its side. With or work amp. with what you've got. You yeah. know, that was the best thing that we learned, I think, is, yeah. you know, if you had what was on in front of you. That was it. Did, were you guys blown away and inspired by Pet Sounds, the Beach Boys, when that happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a That's game changer. Great. That and even some of the Beatles. Sergeant stuff. Pepper. Yeah, you I mean, you just never heard anything like it. Yeah. You, I mean, considering... You yeah, I mean the technology or the lack thereof? You yeah, I mean some of the stuff you yeah, mean that those bands did with the technology at the time was mind blowing. And then the rock operas with the Who, and then Freddie Mercury, oh, yeah. and the and, yep. the and the operatic layers. I mean, wow! Yeah. How Incredible. many how, how many tracks did he use on them? Was it like sixty four vocal tracks for that 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 song? Which Bohemian one? Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody is layers and layers. I don't know how many tracks they use. Did you guys see the film? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, mm. that was crap. yeah, but I know they did. I loved it. I thought it was terrible. Yeah. Really? Absolutely. Well, it was. I, it wasn't I historically. Loved it. I loved it. Accurate. Yeah. It wasn't anything accurate. There was nothing accurate. Really? It was pure Hollywood. Yeah, it was but I still terrible. laughed and cried. I did too. I yeah. laughed. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him, I asked him his favorite bit about that movie, and yeah. he said, the teeth. The ending. And, and I went, oh my man, God. if that's all you got out of it, you just missed it. What, what about um, Lady Gaga in Star is Born? Uh, I also cried. I mean, I, I wasn't big on the spoiler alert, the, yeah. the suicide, yeah. but um, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Did you see a movie called Yesterday? I heard all about this. You gotta go. Very see enjoyable, it. right? It, it it's really good. It's a it's a it's an Indian guy, right? And yeah. he's he's a fan of the Beatles, and yeah. something and trouble ensues, and he changes the world. Yeah, can I? Yeah, but I don't want to spoil yeah, okay. it. Okay, no spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but go watch it because it is a really interesting little movie. So li literally, just to get some context for our listeners, um, Richard, five Grammy awards, not bad. Should well done. Six. 
<laughs> Absolutely. It should be, you know, six. let's make it 10. Now, when you won the Grammy for Tom Petty's Wildflowers, that was the record, right? The, or the song. The record. It was for the record. So everyone, I think, is going to know this song. I'll spin it in a second. But look at um, some of these people that you've worked with. And, we'll, of course, we'll talk about with Peter's credits. But And you guys shared some credits as well. Bob Skaggs, George Harrison, Roy Orbison, Wilco, Green Day, Delbert McClinton, Robert Plant, The Traveling Wilburys, Freddie Mercury, the Dixie Chicks. Um, wow, that's a lot. And Joe, hey, Joe Cocker, Ringo Starr, Show Crow, The Little River Band. Wow, it's real slacker. Liberace, too. Liberace. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Were you really? No. no. Placido no. Domingo. No. Uh, plus, yes. <laughs> and, and now look at Peter. Like, Peter, if I can, if I can read my uh, Nick Gilder, Echo and the Bunnymen, Kevin Welch, Rodney Krell, Mike Henderson, Steve Earl, AC. DC, Ashley Cleveland. No, that's not right. This is good stuff here. But now, and uh, what you really are known for is that when you Google your name, the first thing that comes up is the record that I'm a huge fan of, The Knack. Get The Knack. Right. Several of the Blondie records, Parallel Lines, mm -hmm. and some of the Pat Benatar stuff, Get Nervous. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Now, together at Treasure Isle Studios, we've worked on... Montgomery Gentry, Frankie Ballard, Randy Owen, Josh Thompson, The Road Handers, Michael Tyler, Emily West, even Shalacy Griffin did a project. Shawika? <laughs> did you remember that? And then so a lot of times is we're working with Jason Aldean's producer, Michael Knox. We're getting drum sounds. We're creating music. We finish the music. You mix it. It goes over to Richard's studio. He masters it. Yeah. It's like a, a dream team here. One so thing cool. though, Rich, you... If you could read his credits again and just put the word boys after the, each of the artists, it sounds much more impressive. Nick Gilder boys, boys Echo and the Bunnymen boys, <laughs> Kevin Welch boys, <laughs> Rodney Crowell boys. The Knack boys. You know? <laughs> I mean, let's play just a, a little sampling. Now, first, I think we need to start with this, really, because Richard, this was one of your first production credits, I think. Tell us the story. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, engineer credits. You're the engineer. Yes, the engineer. And the year of this is early 70s? 70, 74. 74. Wait for it. Oh, 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 oh. Someone added something. Need some wind chimes. Everybody was kung fu Do we, need, do we have a drummer in the house? Do we have a drummer? <laughs> but they fought with expert. Check out that bass line. Frank McDonald. Who was the drummer on that? Because I played that song a million times wearing a wig. John Richardson. <laughs> that was John Richardson. I, it's I, the only I, session wait, he wait. did for us you, because uh, Barry D'Souza wasn't available for the session. Was he a, f um, a working London drummer? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I always thought it was Spinetti. No. Oh. Spinetti is Italian guy in Henry's, London. Henry Spinetti. Oh. Yeah, he was really brother good. of younger brother of Victor, the actor Victor Spinetti. Spinetti, interesting. Sp spaghetti with Spinetti. It would have been a great show. How does show. an Italian British guy sound? Yeah, you know? how does that work? <laughs> did he have a British accent? <laughs> of course he did. Wow, Actually, he did. a Welsh accent. Did he? It's incredible. What, what do you guys think Redmond is? Because I haven't done Twenty Three and Me, but I consider myself Italian because my mom Paradiso, which means paradise, right? So my name. Richie Paradise, Dick Paradise. Oh I think you're from Mercury, where you got the red and the mond, which would be the world, right? So you'd be the red world. But is it? But is it? Is that Welsh or English? What do you think? Red no, it's alien. I think. <laughs> yeah, alien's what I would go with. Yeah, Can Irish. You know, from yeah. a voiceover perspective, saying your last name is tough. The only other Redmond. <laughs> Redmond. There's red, a. There's red. a. In the United States, there's when a. I, when I when I recorded a, the beginning of this show, yeah. the Rich Redmond show. It sounds Redmond. like I'm saying Redmond. Yeah. So I'm like literally going Rich Redmond show. Yes. And it's there's a there's a, a famous air traffic controller and a famous meteorologist in the states. That's what I'm up against on Google. Really? But I don't know about over the. Over you look the, yourself up on Google. Every, Every day. day, twice a day. Right. No, I get Google alerts. Um, so there's Are your you? there's your kung fu fighting. Yeah, just to make sure there's some good stuff happening out there. And then uh, this is what you won the Grammy for. Here it comes. How many cover bands are doing that song right now? I did. That's fantastic. 
I love the kick drum sound. You I love the drum sound. Yeah, right? With you tonight, I'll take, I'll take you on a moonlight ride. Has like a room ambiance to it. Yeah, well, I think one of the really cool things about this record is what's not there. Right. You know, because you can hear all this. Well, he was there. He wasn't there. Well, that explains <laughs> he wasn't there. there. I wasn't there. there. <laughs> we were not there, indeed. We were not there. Yeah. Now, don't you think that now we would be shot if we turned the drums up that hot in the mix in a country record? I don't think they're that hot in our records. I mean. Oh, I think they're very hot in your records. Are you think records. so? This is Pete's work. This is the best bit because the drums haven't come in yet. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> What song is this? My Kind of Party. I'm joking. Sorry. That doesn't sound as loud to me. Yeah, but listen to what else is going on. You know, you've got a wall of guitars, so... And the thing is that there's no real processing to the kick... I'm listening to the kick drum for some reason. No, it's it's just... It's just... It is. That's just a straight... Yeah. That's just his drum. It's it's not like Lars Ulrich off the And Justice for All record punch, you know, with the... Sub frequency bass thing happening. That's funny. Well, when we're when we're on um, the guy that was an amazing before ears hit, and if I ever have to play with um, a monitor, I always tell the the monitor engineer, "Give me that Lars Ulrich high end click on the kick, so I can hear it." Well, you want to be able to hear it in the wedge. Now, what did they do on something like that? What did they Mm. they put a mic at the beater head? Well, they can do it one of many different ways. Right. Most of the time, you. I mean, if you hear a kick drum like that, which just sounds like a big click, yeah, that's just a truckload of EQ, right? That's that's and compression, what I would think, right? Sometimes I heard that they will, they'll take a it quarter depends. and they'll tape a quarter to where the beater hits, beater hits. and boom, and then the wood beater against the yeah. the yeah. quarter. Yeah, you can do that. But I mean, the the, the, but the, the head's feel, not gonna last. Yeah, I remember, you know, back in the day that album came out, there were you know guys that were beefing up their car stereo sound systems to have the bazooka tubes in them. Yeah, and I would say, I know you want to play, you know, the hip hop stuff of the day, play this. Yeah. And I mean, this thing would destroy speakers. The bass drum sound they got. The Lars Ulrich sound. Oh my On gosh. what record? And Justice for and All. And Justice for All. Mm-hmm. And that defined a generation of the drum sounds for metal for yeah. the next 10, 15 Let's years. Let's check that out. Let's check that out. You've got, uh, I mean, Pantera was the next one to do it, you know, with uh, Vinnie Paul on drums. Yeah, if you do. Uh, Which track? I guess you could do. Sandman? Uh, well, one, it does it. The, the, oh, there's no Sandman sound on there. Well, one doesn't come in for a while. That's for sure. show. But you can't hear the snare drum. The snare is choked. What up? Not my favorite music. Um, the snare drum sounds like it, it was. A, it's like a Ludwig eighth grade band starter kit. Right. Yeah. And it's got a ton of like toilet paper on it. Oh my yeah, it's god! Right? It's Back to the Peter death. and Richard play playlist. Now, this makes me love Peter even more because I thought Stop this band me. was incredible. <laughs> Remove your hands. Bruce Gary was the drummer, and right. he was the house drummer at Capitol Records, and he died way too way young. Way too young. My Bologna. Okay, now Pete, that was a very popular band in like 81, 82 in Los Angeles. They took yep. they took the city by storm. And you were telling me some stories about how they went into the studio as a band and played each track down like it was a live show. No yep. click. No, if you went to see that band live. That's what you heard. That's what you heard. That's incredible. That's, so they just, they just ripped it out. That's what you heard. Yeah, but they've been playing all those songs off that first record, you know, around the clubs of LA mm-hmm. for... I don't know, three years maybe? Yeah. Maybe I'm not quite right on that. They were ready to record. But a long time. I mean, they play four nights a week, mm-hmm. and they played those songs. Right. You know, so by the time they went in the studio, they didn't think. They just played. That record took, from beginning to end, I think it took 12 days. Yes. You the know, whole thing. Yeah. From wow, beginning, mastering and everything. Yeah. Wow. Done. Mm-hmm. Off, off to the plant. 
Now we're pretty. Uh, now we're in that back in those days. That was fast because the budgets were massive, right? And people could kind of like hunker down in the studio and experiment and really take their time. When we're doing like a like a, an Aldine record, we're doing two songs every three hours. So we right. do four songs a day. Yeah, basic we do about four songs a day. Yeah, we do four songs a day. There's. 15 songs on the record so that's a couple days right there then there's a couple of days for percussion and guitar overdubs then we do vocals so we're looking at maybe same amount of time right 15 days maybe total no, a little bit longer yeah a little bit longer mm -hmm. you go back Not to the kung fu fighting thing that was the fourth song on a three-hour session wow so that's really? wow that's 30 minutes a song 30 40 well, actually minutes a that song. one was started at 10 minutes to one <laughs> before lunch <laughs> And finished by one. Yeah. Had to be. Otherwise, you pay over. I love pay his over dry time. humor. I don't know if he's being serious he's or being funny. True. No, yeah. no, no. He's They're brilliant. like, guys, we can either go we to lunch that, early that or intro, we can. That intro you were talking right, about, right. Mm -hmm. that was recorded during the lunch break. In, that and then was done added. After. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. What a story. So. Wow. So in the height of the music business, uh, I won't call it the height, but when it was super healthy and you guys were in London, mm -hmm. so you guys were tracking multiple songs per session like we do here. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Well, well we, we, we work with professionals though, right? Yeah. yeah. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> now I got a question. Yeah, when, but you it know, depends who it was. You I mean, if it was a bunch of session guys, you know, it was one of those things I mean, where the artist <clears throat> was a singer, Yeah. you know, and yeah. you brought in a great band, you know, you'd be cutting four or five songs every three hours. But if it was a band... You know, a completely self-contained band that could play. Right. You know, it was a slightly different pace. Yeah. Right. The, the 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 most I've done in terms of quantity, two different types of. Uh, there was a a dance band called Victor Sylvester Dance Band, and he used to have tw you know twelve uh, s songs on, a, on an album, mm -hmm. um, and we would cut fourteen songs in two sessions, straight to stereo. Yeah. You know? And uh, that would be done, you know, an album in a day. Actually, it was an album, album and a bit. So seven songs a session. No, seven songs a day. Oh, yeah, seven songs a, a day. Spread day. over two, I mean, two sessions. Gotcha. And the extra two songs, after six albums, he had an album for free. You know? so, <laughs> right. Wow. You know, he'd make sure he had his right number of waltzes, foxtrots, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and then rock band-wise, uh, we did an album, started at 11, and it was overdubbed, mixed, and delivered by 10.30 that same night. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That was a band called Hundred Weight. So oh. you really have to have your skill set yeah. together. But you, it, yeah. Sorry. No. But you, usually it uh, didn't go that way. Usually it was a few days of tracking. Yeah. And then a few days of overdubs. Hmm. And then a day of mixing. <laughs> Do you guys feel like there's a... There's a memoir in each of you. There's a lot of stories there. Oh, there's a lot of stories. Oh, yeah. I bet. Did you ever think about putting some of this down or like? I uh, did until I read everybody else's book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, I you can tell say, stories you know, without ruining people's I, lives I'll and breaking up their marriages. I can certainly give a tip to the next person. Sure. Right. To to write a book. Yeah. Um, don't do what everybody else does, and that is, well, I started to. Yeah, because you read everybody's book. By the time you get to the last chapter, but now I'm just sick and this spinning on my thumb and not doing anything. You know, right. I wish I was famous again, you know. Mm -hmm. You should start with today and go back because it's much more fun to end up with... Well, that sounds like day. a great idea for your book. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. But um, <laughs> in terms of like a uh, biography type thing, start yeah. in the middle of your... That's kind of like what, you know... Start with today. Yeah, that's... Start that's, with today. You and I talked about that when you wrote your book, The Crash Course for Success, here, available now on Amazon. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, you're very welcome. Now I don't have to be the pitch guy. Um, you know, Howard Stern put out his book... Uh, in the mid 90s private parts and it served as somewhat of a biography a biopic told of the different stories that, I, that he probably told on the air a thousand times but he put it in book form made mm -hmm. him a published author yeah mm -hmm. it's never too late you Gosh. know and then he did uh miss america and now he's got his book out called uh, howard stern comes again yeah i gotta i gotta get that one we'll have, tag him in this having dissed the, <clears throat> the biography books there are two from our side of the thing that should be read um al schmidt's book mm -hmm. basically because he's done everything the right way forever and yeah. still doing it and you there's nothing you in that book that you don't need to know al um, schmidt okay yeah, yeah he's i mean just the god and um norman and norman yeah, yeah uh john lennon called me normal but, yeah wow. wow i think you norman lent schmidt. me the al schmidt book no he may have done i can 
One of you guys Cause, lent, cause I me, don't have it. lent me a book. No, I, I think like, check I this out. Maybe the... I'll have a look, see what's missing. Yeah, and maybe the Norman <laughs> book or maybe the Emmerich book. I mean, I may have lent yeah, you Jeff's book. It may have been the Emmerich book. Yeah. Yeah. So that's required reading for... Because this always reminds me of the story of like, I don't know if you guys ever met Phil Ramone, but it's that classic story of mm-hmm. he started sweeping the studio mm-hmm. floor and then yeah, one day the assistant engineer was sick and he got thrown into yeah. the position mm-hmm. and then he just swam that's, in the deep end of the pool. Yeah, works. but that's kind of what happened to us. Yeah, yeah. that's how it You works. know, because the first six months, you mean, I worked in London... You know, I was like, you. Know, my task was, all right, Coleman, make yourself useful. Tea and sandwiches, please. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then when I got promoted, I was allowed to sweep the floor. Yeah. And then wrap up mic cords. That was my legendary story. Yeah, but yeah. that's how we started. But that's how everybody started. And you yeah. were, hum- but you were humble enough to do it. Yeah, but I think the really cool thing. I mean, it was a great life lesson because um, I have never asked anybody in the studio to do anything that I haven't done before. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big culture builder right yeah, there. Yeah, so that's really easy. I mean, so yep. if somebody starts bitching about... Well, most of those things well, are Well, even I don't... <laughs> well, like, our, you know, our assistant engineers, uh, Brandon and Sam, that we've worked with over the years, so many years. I mean, it's like, Sam coffee and it's just like he knows that is in his lane and he better keep that coffee pot full but you know are you, are you a, you'll still get coffee if need be i mean it's you see yourself kind of above that or you, no you, hell you, no you still serve right no on tracking sessions you yeah. mean when yeah i mean you mean we're in tracking with we're Jason. pounding coffee yeah hey, i'm making more pots of coffee than anybody else yeah well yeah up until we got the Keurig. Machine. Well, coffee and nicot- <laughs> coffee and nicotine is your favorite. Like uh, you have a romance. I quit smoking. Good but for you. You did that about seven times. No, the, this it's, time I've actually managed to actually, stay transition. Yeah. So yeah, I quit you smoking. Got, you got the vape. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I sure hope that they don't find bad things about that because they are finding some bad things. Yeah, and you I know, I read a lot of articles about it, but you know what? There's he uses um, a condom, I think. With yeah, that. yeah, even I do. <laughs> Well, it depends which end. <laughs> it, I, it, it, yeah. Here I mean, is the thing. Yeah. Anybody can write an opinion on what's good and what's not good. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean from my standpoint, after I quit smoking, yeah. you know, which has only been seven weeks, maybe. It's great. Good I, for you. I feel so much better. Your body mm-hmm. instantly starts healing yeah. itself. Yeah. yeah, you mean I don't ache like I used to ache. You mean I don't wheeze like I used to wheeze. And your new girlfriend can't believe how young you look. It's awesome. I like hearing these I stories. I see, and that one alone. Too. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and are you, a married, are you a married man? Yes. Did your marriage survive the <clears throat> music business? How many years? Uh, this one has. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and you're on your second? Yeah. I don't feel so bad about myself. No, we're all on our second. <laughs> you know, if you're not on your second, something's wrong. Our band has 15 marriages. Okay. It's, it I'm is still insane. on my first. I'm no, Jim, you're year. good. You're still I'm, on I'm your first I'm one. I'm into good. year 19. Do not. For you. you. met her at the Journey Show. Do not get rid of Courtney. Right. The best, the best yeah. $12 you spent. Yeah. That's what you said. That was hilarious. Do you know the funny thing is? What? I actually walked up to get the two $12 tickets <laughs> and, and and a friend of mine walked up to me and said, don't buy the tickets, you know, because they bought eight and they had mm-hmm. two people didn't show. Nice. You know, so they gave us the Cheap tickets. Cheap date. So you didn't spend 12 bucks a ticket. No, I didn't spend anything. This is the uh, Resurrection tribute band. We were, I, I, I was looking at him and I'm going, Jim Hanley. Oh, that guy from somewhere. That's I our thought, buddy, Jim Hanley. You know, Jim Hanley, the guy that was, it worked for the Carters company. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's a yes. kid. Yep. He was the drummer that night. Yeah. Killer yeah, drummer. Is. I actually thought that band was really, really um, good because I think what they do <clears throat> is about as good as a tribute band yeah. can get. They, because, absolutely. Because they have worked really, really hard. Really hard at it. Yeah. yeah. And I actually thought the show was great, except the power cuts. Yeah. You know, they kept blowing well, and that they, was breakers go, or whatever they were doing. Go see them over at Third and Lindsley because they pack that place and they sell it out every time. Oh, Amazing. I thought they were terrific at the. Speaking of know, my Johnson. Sharona, and, and it's like I have two questions for you. So when you produce a song of that magnitude, and then you got a guy like Weird Al Yankovic that goes ahead and puts a parody to it, and right. they re, I guess he reproduces the song. Yeah. To right. match it ex- almost exactly as he possibly can get. Well, it's it, close, yeah. Right. Do you do you listen to it and go, well, he got that wrong? No. No. No, is I it, just don't listen to it. Right. Yeah. Well, but I mean, but is, there, is there anything that you have out that you're kind of like, man, we could have done this on or, you know. Everything? I think Everything, you can, do you? You, th- you second sure. guess everything, do you? Yeah, I mean, I think you can pretty much go back over, I mean, a career's worth of, 
you know, recording, mainly mixing probably. Right. I mean, certainly, I mean, producing, you know, where you go back and you think, man, I wish I'd have done this like this and not the way I did it. Anything in particular that stands out? No, not really. Really? I mean, lots of things. Yeah. Yeah, you mean, but when you're producing records, you mean when you're in your mid to late 20s, yeah. you know, and then you put your ear on it in your 60s, you know, with all the water, you I'm mean, that's so gone under the bridge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but you I know, mean, you, you know, hear things and you go, what the hell was I thinking? Exactly. Yeah. You think know, it, but that's part of growing, I think. I think about, you know, the uh, Black album from, you know, getting back to Metallica. And they did a documentary on it called Binge and Purge. I was a huge Metallica fan at some point. I still am to a certain extent. Um, they did 10 months in the studio yeah. to record that album. Yeah. That, that's too much. They got off light, I think. But they, they wrote the songs <laughs> in the <laughs> studio. You know, they, well, actually, they wrote them in the studio. That's right. just really expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they, you know, that's back in the day when they had money that's to That's what burn. they did for Appetite for Destruction. It took a year. They're like, where's Slash? We're trying to get the band in the same place at the same time yep. and in yeah. the same state of mind hungover. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, we don't do that in Nashville. It's like you show up at 9 a.m. to get drum sounds. You time pound is money. The, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it is it is big business. It's also a different time when, you know, some of the poor bands that didn't make it, mm-hmm. but had that same attitude of, well, it doesn't matter because the record company's paying for it. But they owe all the money yeah. back. It's absolutely. Well, they, they don't well, they know that. Yeah. They just so, yeah. so, Pete, Heart of Glass with that little Farfisa, like uh, Casio drum machine thing at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Isn't mm-hmm. it Roland? Is it Roland? I can't even remember. Yeah. There was a long it time like ago. A oh, that. In the left speaker, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it may be a Roland. Any fond memories or fun stories about this crew of folks that are still out doing it? I saw them at the Greek Theater. Well, this was one of the few records that we actually recorded in New York. Ah. This was cut in the record plan. I don't know. Oh, yeah. What was it? Alrec board? Could be. Did you ever see him at CBGB's, the original? Which is no. now a John Varvedo store? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> that I am always at? No. No, but they were really interesting because they were so different. Yeah. You mean yeah, it's like what? punk disco pop. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it was a lot of fun making this right. And then the skinny ties and the cool haircuts yeah. and she was sexy. Yeah. And, woo! Yeah, but they were good. Heck yeah. You know, they wrote great songs too. Now what about this? You're not playing any. Ah, Miss Pat. Are you still friendly with some people that you yeah. guys? Yeah. Yeah, you might saw Pat and Neil, I don't know, a few years back when they came through. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's got a great voice. You know, she was one of my favorite singers. Iconic rock singer. I yeah. ever worked with and probably out of all the singers I ever worked with, she was the hardest working mm-hmm. because she always wanted the absolute best. Great, great work ethic. And guys, this is yep. pre Pro Tools tuning. Oh, hell yeah. So how do you go about getting a vocal? Was it front to back and then you just keep doing it and doing it? Were you splicing tape? Well, we used to punch. Mm-hmm. I mean, Pat insisted that we use one track and we just punch. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's how we did these. And don't forget, that doesn't mean if, like today, you punch. If you don't like what you punch in, you can go back. Yeah, you can undo it. No, so no, no. We no, had no. redo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not undo. But this there was, was no analog. tuning software, so there's actually some some character and some personality and some human. imperfection. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's also we a still case use of... tricks. Yeah, you got, you know, you need a bit of talent, you know, in even back then. Sure. You know, because you can't fix stuff. You mean the two? Well, you mean you could put a harmonizer or something, you mean a fixer. Eventually, yeah. Hey, you, you had know, to a be able to sing. In a while, but you could adjust the tape machine speed as they were recording. Wow. Yeah, you could do that's, all kinds I mean, of that's a, a craft, guys. Yeah. That's yeah, incredible. It was much more hands on and much more risk. And, yeah, it's very uh, risky. The stakes know, so are you high. Had, you had adrenaline when, yeah. you were, when you were doing it then. For sure. You, do, you don't now. You s- now, what about this, Richard? The Traveling Wilburys, I mean, a c- critic's darling band. That's great. Well, it's all right. I mean, everyone knows this. You'd have to be living under a rock. Well, it's all right. if you live Jim Keltner? Well, yeah. In court in Los Angeles? Right. He was in the video. That's what you call a lot of talent in the room at the same time. You better believe it. Now, with those vocals, they were cut all at once of that horn, those harmonies, right? 
Pretty much. Were they? You can sit around and wait for the phone. Wow. Did we hear the comedian that does the, uh, if Tom Petty and Bob Dylan did a song together? How does that go? I haven't heard that. It's basically like, you know, uh, well, why don't we do this? Uh, take it, Bob. Oh, all right, let's take it. And they just, you know, they both sound the same. No. <laughs> That's it. That's Jim's embarrassing story of the... Uh, that is incredibly... The is there a sadness thing in here? There you go. Mm. There you go. About... We'll do... Okay, yeah. yeah. There we go. There it is. <laughs> Um, I actually have a story getting back to getting into what you guys did. It's very similar to how I tell the story all the time about how I got in the radio. How I, the first day on the air for me. Was it scary? Was, Frightening? It was it was somewhat scary. I was still I was actually doing electrical work for a local electrician and at night I would go to the radio station and cut my teeth on the uh, in the production room doing commercials and things of that nature. Right. <clears throat> back then we would have to do things on reel to reel. You would put your voice over on reel to reel. I would edit everything together, fire off a CD, hit the reel to reel, and get everything in at the same time in real time and fly the faders, right? And uh, so I got really good at that. And because of the program director, our boss, hearing my voice on the air in a commercial sense, uh, one night uh, I came in and. And this is after a day of spending with a guy who told me I would never be on the air. He basically said, he says, you'll, you'll never get on the air. Ouch. Yeah. You yeah. proved him wrong. Oh, yeah, that very night. That was the fuel. So I was in the, uh, in the production studio, and a very good friend of mine today comes in, and he goes, hey, you want to be on the air? And I said, uh, yeah, someday. He goes, no, now. <laughs> and, I got, and the reason being is because the program director, he bounced it was he had the afternoon shift, so my buddy who did the evening shift, he had to fill in for the program director. The guy who typically filled in for him, we couldn't get a hold of him. It literally got down to the point of who's in the building. Yeah, you know, who's, is the gen, is the janitor standing? here? Yeah, can we? Is it the guy who cleans? Can we get him? You know, so I was the one guy left in the building, and that was my first night on the air. That's wow. great. That's yeah. a great story. And he basically it was a fifty thousand watt stick, and and uh, he t he hands the, uh, the controls over to me. He goes, oh, we're going to introduce a new guy here, and here we go. And said, uh, you know, Jim McCoy, what are you calling you? I said, I call myself Fat Gilly. Okay, Fat Gilly, take it away. And I sat there and went. <laughs> and he goes, this is the oh my gosh, this is the part where you talk. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is, am I on? <laughs> it was a good first night though. Wow. And then the next day, the guy who told me that I would never be on the air. Yeah. That felt good. Yeah, right? it served up a little bit of. Uh, Did you ever have any negative Nellies or naysayers in your part of your career or when you were in writing that success, people that wanted to dethrone you? Or is, it's been pretty smooth sailing for you guys. You guys just seem like him. Other than me. <laughs> him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, him. Well, it's nice to have be friends for so long. You guys can share all your victories and successes. And yeah, well, the best thing you know, that we've got going for each other is, you know, I mean, Richard and I usually have breakfast pretty much once a week. That's great. That's awesome. Where do you guys go? <laughs> is it secret? Where? Is it like, what day and what time? Dude? It's no, like yeah. No, that's too much. Yeah, yeah. that's too. Much. <laughs> you know, so him and I can talk about anything. Yeah, and that the best thing is that we can say anything to each other about anything and the other one won't get offended that's awesome yeah. or if they do it's not for long you do that for me every time i see you i know yeah I know. rich cuts me down all the time you eviscerate all of us and you still don't have kurt and telly's names correct it's I like know. well you, they look the same yeah. well, well they look the same i just call them katali because then i can't <laughs> get it wrong <laughs> Well, all you guys look the same, didn't they? Yeah, they all look the same. Just so we have, like, we yeah. look like we stuck our finger yeah. in an electrical socket. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm wearing headphones. I know. Ruining your hair again, totally Rich. Totally ruining it for the picture. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. Yeah. Happens to me all the time. You know, the, you know, the funny thing is, uh, I'm glad I come in and I look different, because every time Peter sees me, I think he recognizes me. So yeah. I've, seen, I've seen him a couple of times outside, but also in the studio, and he's always there with, hey, how you doing? Kind of like, you know, Kurt is, but and then you got Tully sitting there. Yeah, like, Tully's like, wah, like wah, what, are you, wah. what are you doing here? Yeah. You know? <laughs> My favorite Rich Redman story was when we first started working together. Yeah. You can always cut this out. Um, what do you mean? He's going to turn it up. He's going to turn it up. Well, of course. Turn it up. <laughs> you in the early days, you've, you're rich. Well, all of the guys in the band were very hair conscious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fair dues. Oh, yeah. And, of, of course, you mean, when you're using... You mean lots of sticky goop? Yeah. You mean to get your hair pointed up and stuff? Yeah. Your worst nightmare is a pair of headphones. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're a drummer like Rich, you know, because yeah. Rich puts a lot of energy in, he plays really hard, and he, you mean, he's dancing while he's playing. He really does. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's great fun to watch. Mm -hmm. but he, 
you mean the entertainment value? Thanks, oh, yeah. You know, you just got to mute it. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, when we had but, when we had Parmalee on, yeah. we actually spent I think about five minutes talking about yeah, the product they products. put in their hair. Yeah. yeah, but Rich would walk out of the studio into the bathroom and get himself all set up again, fix his hair, and then walk in the control room. Yeah. Oh my god! And because there's I, always a videographer or a camera yeah, person. No, around. no, no. I understood why I did it, but it 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 just always tickled me pink, and I just could not stop laughing about it. <laughs> you, this this went on for years, and then he finally stopped. That's yeah. the reason why he bought an Audi because I told him I said, you know, when you walk into places, people look at you and they go, he's he's somebody. I said, and you know what he's they're gonna think. When you walk back to a Honda Element, they're going to go, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not the person I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not the somebody I was thinking of. You never, well, got, never got around to doing the double-sided tape thing? No. That, that would have no. that been fun. <laughs> double-sided. <laughs> yeah, the drummer for Muse actually takes a pair of headphones and get gaff tapes them to his head. That's a really? thing for him. Yeah, it's so strange. But then we got wow. in-ear monitors. I would never do that. I, for some reason, ears don't. I'm not a fond of those in the studio. I like a nice pair of cans, man, yeah. you know? In yeah. more ways than one. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> These actually sound pretty good. They're not bad. So no, they sound pretty good. Now, where are you guys in your in your career, all of you have experienced? <clears throat> are you still enjoying this? And like, like, what is some stuff that you would, <laughs> advice you would give to someone that say... Getting 21 time. years old that wants to get into this business and do what you guys do. Richard, you're far more diplomatic. Go. Uh, given that uh, our industry is now computer-based, mm -hmm. I would suggest you pick uh, one of the most popular doors, digital audio workstation mm -hmm. software mm -hmm. programs, and be the best you can be at knowing it and using that right. so that you can present yourself as an asset. You know, and if you can't afford to go to one of the schools or academies or whatever, there's a hell of a lot of great information for free or for very little cost on the internet. YouTube yeah. tutorials. Mm -hmm. Some of them, I tell you, are incredible. Are really, really good. Yeah. Some of them are just embarrassingly <laughs> wrong. Yeah. You know, but uh, you can sift through. <laughs> But, you know, from a production standpoint, doing radio all my life, you can you can learn everything about the logistics of an editor. But if you don't have the ear for it, yeah, it's you got to develop the ear yeah, for it. But, the, but there again, you know, I could be a great drummer, but for one thing, I can't play in time. Yeah. Right. Inside, I know what should be played. Right. Right. Yeah. But coordination. Yeah. Memory. Yeah. Yeah. Recall. Such a. A fantastic part of what you do you now, being you, great yeah that comes after you've recognized the ability the, the fact that you can at least be ordinary you know yeah, yeah. if yeah. you can't be ordinary you don't stand very much chance of being great you know when it's right rich do you remember when you you felt like your talent level was starting to actively be ratcheted up yes, when you were when you were getting better at what you do well, you know, it was Texas maybe. So or? for me, I was a product of, you know, music education. So it was like seven years of higher education, like playing all sorts of difficult music. So we're talking like learning how to play Count Basie music and swing a 17 piece big band and then play in an orchestra and then play 20th century music or play the music of Frank Zappa. And so by the time you get to Nashville, I've, I had already played the most difficult music I was ever going to play in my life. And I, the challenge for me and what Music City taught me was how to play a song. And as each of the years would pass, the drums got bigger, the set got smaller, and I played less and less and less, and it may became less and less about me and serving. And then you become a master of that. And as one, and once you figure out how to make it about everyone else and bring a song to life, God, you'll work forever. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Do you guys remember that point in your careers where you felt like your talent level, because maybe who you were being surrounded by, all of a sudden it started hockey sticking up? For me, it was Vegas when I moved to Vegas. Yeah. Well, I think. You, most engineers will tell you this. You mean when you start hearing your records on the radio, mm -hmm. you're doing something right. Yeah, yeah. Th that never gets old. I mean, I'm sure. No. I'm sure you like hearing Blondie and Pat Benatar I or do. the Traveling Wilburys, and you go like, "Now, do you?" No, if I hear the Wilburys, I switch the station. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, because it might be. Showing. Now, when <laughs> you hear that, are you transported back to the experience of what happened during the tracking day? 
Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. It, it depends if it was a good day or a bad day. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because like for me, like I tell other people and I like like life is a collection of experiences. So like I just try to have a great day and I put that together with another great day. So when I hear something on the radio that I was fortunate enough to play and I'm thinking about the people that I spent time with and trying to remember what happened that day. Because I know when we're tracking it, I don't want to go home sometimes at the end of the day. We're just having so You're much fun. I'm like, ah, oh, this is... Yeah. <sighs> I gotta go back well, to Well, for all you guys, you can hear, you know, your stuff being played back to you at any given moment in the supermarket, in your car, and you, yeah. it brings you back to that time, but then you realize that for people who heard the songs at the times that they came out, you also help them create reference points to their life and they refer back to memories. A yeah. soundtrack you know of their lives. Yeah. Yeah, you might at one point it was about weed killer weed. No, now it's about get, weed killer. Yeah, you might get the biggest <laughs> kick out of listening to something that I did. Yeah, I mean, when I was in my 20s, you know, I'm sure Richard will say the same thing. Yeah. You mean something where you didn't have I a didn't massive amount of I didn't get a kick out of anything you did in your 20s. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you listen to, yeah, I mean, you listen to a record that you did, you mean, which was an absolute nightmare to mix because mm. you didn't have that many tracks to begin with. Right. You know, you didn't have any automation. You know, you had a lot of marks on a console and you went, right, you're doing this, you're doing it. Lots of hands. Mm. And somehow you managed to get your way through a mix. Mm -hmm. you know and you go good enough because that's as good as we're going to get it because we're never all going to be able to do it again like that right you know and that became the record and if you're lucky enough to hear it on the radio you know you look back and you listen to this and you go god how the hell did we mix that with the technology we had yeah especially when you know we're not allowed a disclaimer if you should have heard it before we got it right <laughs> you know really i mean there are many many records that you know you know could sound better but my God, you, know, you challenge anybody else to do better with what you were given. To right. work yeah, with. So you you, would, you hear something and instantly you're like, oh my gosh, I can have a field day on this. Yeah, I mean, by the same token, you get something like you played Wildflowers. Mm -hmm. You know, Jim Scott recorded most of that. And that's where you push the faders up and you think, oh God, I hope I can do a good job on this because yeah. it's so great already. Raw. You know, it's just it's perfect yeah. because it's played well, it's recorded well, produced, written and performed, you know, perfectly. It's your job now to screw it up, you know? Yeah. And that's when you talk about learning and progress, is that's when you learn one of the most important things is don't get in the way of a good sound. Yeah. You know, don't do things because you can. Ah. You know, it's, don't overplay, you know? Right. If it's working, that's the right thing. Stay out of the way of that vocal and storytelling is what I tell all my students. Yeah. Oh my God, you stay out of the way. You got so many circus drummers on Good YouTube. Good advice. Better. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's the, the best thing is learn, realizing that you, you know that the, the mute switch can be yeah. your friend. And one of my favorite sayings of Peter's is, you know, faders in this room go both ways. Mm -hmm. You know, because <laughs> right. you went through that period where it was just turn it up. Oh, well, I need more of this. I need more of this. I need more of this. No one ever says turn everybody down except the lead vocal. Mm -hmm. It's always vocal up, <laughs> yeah. right? Sometimes that subtle little background vocal just adds enough spice to make it. Yeah, nice. it, it, this we get carried away. I I don't recall until the advent of mixing in the box. Uh, well, at least computer aided mixing. Yes. Any producer saying, "Can I point three dB more of the?" Yeah. Mm. Give me a break, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I was made fun of for saying. Uh, on like percent that. on percentage terms, that is a percentage wise, that is a noticeable amount. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But just the terminology. What do you? What is point three? You yeah. say, well, how much is? Point three of the yeah. DB. They wouldn't know. Well, yeah. it, well, it sounds not as adventurous as half. <laughs> the interesting, <laughs> you know, the interesting really thing is some of the early automation systems. You mean yeah. some of the early moving fader systems? Yes. You mean when they first <laughs> came up with that? You mean some of those systems were accurate to within plus or minus one DB? Yeah. Yeah. You know, from one, yeah. you mean playback so to got another. So you 60 channels of plus or minus even one, half a dB, yeah. right? You've got a 30 dB change every time you hit play. Potential change every time you hit play. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know? It's harder. It was harder on the old systems to actually know when you've got the mix because 
it, it, you just didn't know. You had to listen harder. Uh, yeah. You, you yeah. really leaning on your ears. Yeah. I mean, now that we have sure you know digital there. technology, it just seems like everyone is 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 playing music with their eyes and watching waveforms and mixing with waveforms instead yeah. of using this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a that lot is of the very early, true. A lot of the early mixes I did, you I mean that, that were automated. I probably had about 50, 60, 70% of those you mean, faders were actually isolated. Oh, Nothing to do with the computer system at all. Mm -hmm. You know, because the inaccuracy drove me potty. And I would only use the moving faders on things that I absolutely had to. Potty. Right. You learn to take this technology and, yeah. and, and make it... Yeah, make it your advance friend. Advance you, you know. You get uh, maybe when, on the better systems... Uh, you could you got a sustained power cord, you know, and they didn't use tremolo. Mm -hmm. No, you could manually tremolo, yep. especially him. You could manually tremolo. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, yeah. When you're, it's a good technique for newly single men. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know that um, that's, that's all very well, but if you've got other things to do, switching this on, so there the automation's great. You can do that. You can, you know, demonstrate it to whoever might be more in charge than yourself yeah. as the producer or whatever and say how about that and they're going to say it's great and if they don't like it you just don't do it yeah. meanwhile you're still doing all the other stuff you've got this great idea of the sustain cord that goes into a tremolo at the end of the system beautiful you know no door no yeah. pictures but there it is it's taking something you don't like and making it work for you making you better yeah and as for the visual thing um, you're, you're, you're right um, it is very much more visual now, but I don't know that's a, yeah. always a negative. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing thinking about, uh, you know, using, really using your ears. Because uh, when, you know, Pete and I, we've probably done 25 records together where I overdub percussion on top of my drums. Mm -hmm. And we have it down to a science on my distance from the mics, which mics we use, the placement in the room. We, I hit my mark almost like an actor and, and, and I craft it. And then when we listen back, because we know that the shaker is going to be tucked way down in the mix. And then the way you listen to make sure we have the performance, you listen to it so low. Mm. It's like it drives me crazy because I'm kind of deaf from playing the drums a little bit. But yeah, but you, I'm kind of listening to where it's going to be in the mix. Exactly. I you would know? crank it up to make sure it was accurate and that I was tight with the drums. But yeah. you you actually listen to it like as like someone would have it like... Like flavoring. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. there again, see, technology now, if it's used properly, is <laughs> more like the old days. Because a good engineer, we used to be called balance engineers. Yeah. Right? Because... Yeah. The engineer only had one mic. He would balance the seating arrangements to to get the, the thing, yeah. So to get the final. And at Abbey Road, you guys would be wearing white coats, right? Well, the technicians would. Well, the yeah. Te yeah, yeah, not us. Yeah, you know, suit and tie no. for the audio. No, we'd be ah. straight jackets. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the longest time you've ever worked on a song? Like one song. Oh God. Oh weeks. Weeks? Yeah, let's say weeks. Oh, my gosh. And you can't say which one? You know, no, I can't. Okay. You know, no, there's... Uh, nothing you'd know. In 11, 2011, I had a heart attack. And mm. during the procedure, the surgical procedure to save my life, uh, the recovery, the surgeon was saying, you know, you were, he said to me, and, and my wife was there, uh, you know, everything went well, obviously, because <laughs> I'm talking to you. Yes. Um, and you were very cooperative. So, what do you mean? You know, I was out. He goes, well, actually, he said, you were, you were kind of out. He said, but we give you this drug that you don't remember. He said, but sometimes we have to ask you to move to assist us, you know, while they're doing stuff. And, and you do. He said, you were very cooperative. Oh, you're he cut said, open? But, well, it was just... Um, oh, gotcha. Laparoscopic. Yeah, 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 sort yeah. Of, yeah. That's like a horror so, film. Um, so he said, yeah, it's part of the, the drug they administer with the anesthetic. And you just mm -hmm. don't remember and I thought, that's amazing, you know. And then I'd flash back to your question of working with the Ryan twins. I didn't say that. Four days <laughs> doing a, a verse. Oh, my God. You know, and I thought, yeah. Yeah, where was that drug when we were doing vocals? <laughs> <laughs> All these years. You know? Yeah, but every engineer will tell you this story. Yeah. You know, just the, even the names and the faces change. But yes. the nightmare remains. You know, because... <laughs> That's a song. Yeah, but trying to spend, you know, two or three weeks doing one lead vocal... Oh, no. It is soul-destroying. 
Yeah. It is absolutely soul destroying. But you have to be. Well, you can't quit. No. Well, when you're not producing the record, you are no, but it doesn't make subservient any to the to the yeah, producer. But it, yeah, but yeah, it doesn't make any difference right. whether you're producing it, you're engineering it, you're you're sitting there. Yeah, and you're listening to it again and again, and it, and it is soul destroying. And and I'm sorry to cut in there, but I just realized that a really great engineer is the producer, because most of the time you're producing the producer. Yes, you know because huh. sometimes when they've got a situation like that. Uh, they've got all the other things to worry about. Yeah. Like Big picture. budget. Yes. You yeah. know, uh, reputation, uh, you know, everything. And they kind of lose it. You yeah, know? but they got other jobs to do. You mean yeah, like and keeping people happy, keeping people Yeah, occupied. at first you're just hiding with the producer behind the console. <laughs> yeah. Just it's like, oh my God, this is so bad. Isn't it? What do you, what yeah, do you guys do? Yeah, you're getting there, you know, talking, yeah. being encouraging yeah. to the artist. You're a coach, you're a coach. You're a, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but between you, you're having a ball, you know, trying to make each other crack up about how bad this artist is. You know, that's to try you, that's keeping you involved. Sure. In the set. Otherwise, you'd just be there cutting your wrists. Yeah. Because we've got to get this well, done. There's, and there's razors laying around everywhere. And a great well, engineer. They used, they used to be. A, a great yeah. engineer will... Will save the the you know the, will will do everything they can to promote the ability of the person that is failing uh, to the extent of um, you know saying something like hang on a second you know and you go out stand next to the artist and say can I listen to your headphones and you ask your assistant if you go one play the track and you put the headphones on for a second and then you take them off quickly say. Oh my God! Why didn't you tell me the headphone balance was that bad? How can you sing to that? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like you know it isn't because you spent you know, you're trying everything, you know, but you've just given them an excuse to have been crap for three hours. Ah, psychology, yeah, right? psychology. Yeah, so for a lot of the our non musicians out there, there is a little bit of a hierarchy in a tracking session. So you have the recording artist, you have the engineer, the assistant engineer, the producer. Mm -hmm. There's a band on the floor, and then there might be the songwriter, the record label owner the um, entourage you know the friends the publicist the videographer and then sometimes there's so much noise happening people are chit-chatting and they're pounding their coffee and talking about the weekend and peter's just like everyone shut up well you missed the f word <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, I've, i have done that more than i can tell you yeah you know because when you've got the track you know let's say the track was absolutely terrific you know, but the guitar player made one little thing. You you know, the bass player was a little mm -hmm. bit out. You mean on one downbeat, mm -hmm. you know, so you can fix it. Yeah. You know, you can just lob that little bit in and it's all fixed. And you're trying to do this and you've got a couple of musicians out on the floor and you've got 20 people in the control. <laughs> yes. That are just making so much noise. It's like a kitchen party. Yeah. And I can't hear what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And every time I press down the talk back button, the only thing the musician hears in the headphones is all this racket. The yeah. din. Yeah. yeah, the din. Yeah. You know, so I can't talk to them. They can't talk to me. I can't hear what they're doing. And nobody gives a shit. Right. Yeah. right. And sometimes I've reached the point where I just explode. Yeah. I, because I've run out of options. Yeah. This is after I've said, excuse me, mm -hmm. excuse me. You know, because you can walk outside into the lobby, make as much damn noise as you want. I don't care. Yes. But and after then, after yeah. every song for many years, you would go out and you would you would have a. Is smoke that a resetting break. your yeah. ears type of act activity for you? Going out for a cigarette? Because yeah, because I mean, you know, when I used to. No, I think it's me preventing people from getting killed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will tell you that yeah. when I when I would yeah, film murder is illegal. The last the album for for Jason, I was on the floor with Rich shooting some video, and it's actually a part of our uh, our our We Back Challenge. Yeah, video. the We Back you, Challenge. You'll see the first song that we did. We well, I get the, some the dirty looks sometimes because there's a lot not a lot of uh, session drummers that bring in a video crew. And my thing is is that life is going by, and we have this opportunity to to be part of the fabric of musical history Absolutely. and I want to capture it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want I want to be able to say when I'm 80 years old, "Oh my god, I did this and I have the video to prove it." <laughs> I, I would hope to say that at least I know because of my background in radio and recording that I'm aware enough to stay well clear of the placement of the mics. Yeah, and, well you know this. Cause yeah. Cuz it's uh, yeah, it's what I, yeah. you know. Yeah, but some people do not. Right. Yeah. And and yeah, that's I mean, the some thing. people start walking around in the middle of a table. Clump, clump, yeah. clump. And they're kicking stuff and yep. they're walking in front of room mics and yeah. I hope you appreciate that about me is that I sit there no, I, I set do. up okay. and yeah. I lock myself into place 
and, and I don't get in the way of the mic. And then I take you out for a hamburger. After and that. I've had, <laughs> wor- I have, I have had words with these people. Yeah. yeah, you know, in the hope. That- I even pointed out, hey, the kick drum mic fell off one time. Like, you did. Uh, you, you might want to fix that. You did. I should have noticed <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Hey, without putting you guys on the spot, but I think this, I think the listeners would love to hear this. What is something that you are each particularly proud of? I can find it here on Spotify, and we could play a little bit of it. I mean, looking back, do you which go, wow. Jason Aldean album? <laughs> no, I mean, there's there's a lot of history here. Anything Richards recorded? <laughs> How's that, Richard? <laughs> he threw the he threw Sorry, the ball I, to you. No, I'm trying to get him to pay for breakfast on Saturday. Oh, so, <laughs> oh, so we do. But something I'm really proud of. Yeah, that every time it comes on the radio, you will not change it. You're like, wow, and you're transported to that. Oh, time. so it's got to be something that comes on the radio. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> no, I mean, as long as we can find it here on Spotify. Yeah. Um, I mean, we played Wilburys, we played Patty, we played well, something I'm really proud of for the way it turned out, sure, and for my contribution, sure, is from a band called Clanad, C L A N N. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and the song is called The Theme from Harry's Game. Wow, is that a movie? It it's a TV, a TV show, TV, TV show, TV movie. Wow, here we go. It's a great piece of music. Wow. It's epic. It really is. What's the year on this? Yeah, it's about 80. 1980. Wow. European band. Irish. Wow, I can hear that. That's me double track, by the way. <laughs> Check that out. It's on. How many singers are on that? Clement. Three? Yes. Sister. And two brothers. Well, here's another track from them. Let's see if it's similar. In a Lifetime? I didn't do that one. Okay. We don't want to hear it. Yeah, don't play um, that. It's rubbish. <laughs> don't play that. Absolute rubbish. I had Chris McHugh on the show, and uh, I had Lonnie Wilson on the show, and I pulled up tracks for each of them. Like, no, that's Lonnie. And then Chris goes, no. That's, Chris said, that's Lonnie. And then Lonnie said, no, that's Chris, because they would share yeah. cr- credit sometimes. Wow, this has been so fun and so I love talking. This is like nerd talk for me. Chris, well, I, I mean, you guys literally stuff. help shape the soundtrack yeah. generations of people's lives. You know what I love is the Incredible. fact they, they both have the same looks on their faces when they hear their own stuff like I used to. <laughs> no. Like I, I, when I play my Not own stuff, I'd, I'd go like this. Not again. Here and I'd have this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, yeah. My wife calls it the, uh, the radio imaging look that I have on my face when I play my own stuff back. I'm like... <laughs> you hear that? You hear to see what I did there? Yeah. Well, we have to be proud of our work, you know. I have a request. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can I either pee in that kick drum or can we take a bathroom break? Oh, we're going to end it. We're ending right now. <laughs> oh, we're just ending in perfect time to urinate. <laughs> then I'll just go in my pants. Hell. <laughs> oh, is that the urination sound? Uh, wait, hold on. There we go. Oh, oh my god. Thank god for yeah. that. that is just so fantastic. And I'm going to load you guys up with my sample package. <laughs> Your sample package? Yes, I, package. I, I got some samples to give you guys. I, I really hope everyone out there really enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, if you want to find these gentlemen, check out allmusic.com and just type in Peter Coleman and Richard Dodd, and the list is epically long. Except for the fact that really I enjoyed share this brother. with another Thanks Richard Dodd. And, and, there's, another and Peter, there's another Peter Coleman as yeah, well. Yeah, there's another yeah. Peter Coleman too, because some of those things you read off at the beginning, yeah. not me. No! Yep. Okay, so, I mean, it's because I'm thinking Echo Mine and Bunnyman. Me. No. Was that? No. Mind or roll me? No. Nick Gilder? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let me tell you the ones I didn't do. ACDC? Yeah, because I said you would have had stories about that. No. Okay. No. no, I never did that. There's DC, another DC. Peter Coleman who is also English. Mm-hmm. Not as good looking as me. Yes, no way. And uh, see, he, see, on mine, there's another Richard Dodd who is also English. Plays cello. Yes. Yep. And mm-hmm. I think his uh, website is cellodick.com. 
but he's younger than I am, obviously better looking oh and more God. talented. But cello but dick dot com? Yeah, he's a cello player. Oh, yeah. Richard, I got you. Yeah. 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 Um, I would change that. You know, he's, yeah. he's very well known. He does a lot of great stuff, but they put us down, you know, so the stuff you see on old music, Richard Dodd, that says cello. Yes. Yeah. Like that is Christina not you. Aguilera or whatever. Mm-hmm. Not me. Gotcha. Yeah. But for yeah. the most part, I think people that are, that, you know, that, they, that know, they know. Great work, guys. Great work. And I Thank look you. forward to working with you guys some more. Thanks for being here. Guys, Pleasure. what did you learn, Jim? What did you learn? You know, I learned uh, that there's a lot of similarities to uh, you know, radio production and music production, but they got paid a lot better. Fantastic. So we We getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> we are, aren't we? <laughs> what did you learn? Oh, I learned. I learned that um, there are a lot of Peter Coleman's and Richard Dodds. That for sure, and uh, and you know, uh, rolling with the changes and evolving and staying up with current technologies and you know, staying relevant. That's what these guys have done yeah. for a long and time. I think I don't know how you got this set up, but your music feed, you, you need to output less from the source because it's overloading the input. Oh yeah! Wow! Look oh, at that. We're getting advice right? about our show. It's incredible. Oh. I'm Guys, a, thank you so much for tuning into the Rich Redmond Show. As always, keep coming back for the good stuff. Please subscribe, share, rate, and review. It's very, very helpful. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.